Hi everyone, welcome to this post-mortem of my Blitz game number 998. I start off here with uh, e4. My opponent went d5, so we're getting into the classical lines. I go knight f3, the main move. And now he goes d6, a third choice here, known as the Philidor defense. I think this is an interesting way to play. It does lead to a cramped position for black, um, so you have to be willing to put up with that. And um, but but you do have some advantages. One is that um, your opponent at the class level may not be able to uh, play with the space advantage uh, as precisely as a master or a grandmaster would. So you you have chances for counterattack during the game. And uh, and a second advantage is you can get into positions where your opponent is not as familiar with them as you are if you play them all the time. Anyway, I continued with d4 here. I think that's the main way to put the test to the Philidor, but uh, bishop c4 is also a line. But d4 puts the question to black right away uh, of whether he's going to defend the center or give it up. And so he gives it up right away, which you can see is the top choice. Um, keeping the center with knight f6 or knight d7 is also an interesting way to play. It'll lead to more closed positions. So if you're uh, okay with a closed maneuvering position where you have less space than your opponent, you can actually play that and, uh, and you can get some interesting counterattacking chances uh, in those lines as well. But I, I like the way black played it here, just taking. It gives up the center, but it um, opens up a line here and uh, weakens my dark square. So he's going to try and exploit that later, especially in this line where he plays g6 and bishop g7. Uh, I think that's the Larson variation. That's what it was called by the opening book. Um, I'm more used to seeing knight f6 here. And then you, you would get uh, normal development for a while, probably knight to c3, maybe bring the bishop out. At some point, black also has the idea of playing c5 and kicking this knight back, although has to be careful when that is played to not uh, lose the d-pawn. The d-pawn will become backwards, so it's kind of double-edged, but it's, it's sometimes an interesting idea. Anyway, he didn't go that way. He went with g6, I went uh, bishop c4, and now he went queen e7. And after queen e7, we're out of the book. I mean, it's pretty normal here to just uh, play bishop g7, and the line might go like this. Bishop g7, I castle, he plays knight f6, gets the other knight out. Oh, no, gets this knight out, knight f6. I go knight c3, getting the other knight out. He castles, and he's got a, a very nice setup. Looks like a, a King's Indian, but, uh, but the center structure is different. I don't have all those pawns in the center. And, um, you know, he'll develop the queen side and try and prove that my pieces aren't aren't so well placed over there. Should be better for white, of course, but uh, certainly playable for black as well. Anyway, he went queen e7. Also pretty interesting, but um, the chess engine now says white should just win this. It's giving white a plus two advantage at this point. So probably, uh, uh, you know, I didn't play the most accurate moves from here on out because we did get into positions that were uh, pretty equal. Let's see, well, I castled, which is a good way to start, just relying on this little trick if he takes the pawn. I will skewer the queen, so that is defended. He goes bishop g7, and then, uh, yeah, here's here's my first inaccuracy. I retreated the knight. I didn't really need to. Um, my, my knight is defended, and if he wants to give up the bishop that he spent this time developing and making a good piece, uh, that should be good for me. So I really don't have to worry about that trade. Um, so I should just develop a knight c3, and that's how I would keep this... Uh, plus two advantage, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I dropped my knight back to f3. You know, honestly, I didn't realize it was defended when I played that move. I was a little bit uh, not seeing things there. Uh, anyway, he goes uh, bishop g4. That was another slight inaccuracy. He could have uh, maybe brought the bishop out to e6. The chess engine liked that a little better, although these are all about the same. Just uh, keep a slight edge to white. I kicked it, which was uh, reasonable. He takes I take and plays knight c6, and I went c3, and this is a second mistake, and after this it's probably, oh, he didn't go there, I'm sorry, he went uh, knight c6, and I played to c3, as I was about to say, um, this also is uh, an inaccuracy, I, I should have just uh, developed, and once again, you know, he may think about taking my knight here, but probably it's not good for him to give up this bishop that he's spent a lot of trouble <laughs> trying to uh, make into a good piece. 
uh, giving it this good diagonal. I shouldn't uh, trade it off so easily. And uh, it's just a nice developing move for me. So c3, I thought it would sort of permanently limit the scope of this bishop. Um, but it falls to this, uh, well, it doesn't fail exactly, but this is a good move. Knight e5 is a good response and uh, wins back the bishop pair. So um, around here, this is about an even position. And he should probably just uh, grab grab that bishop right away. So uh, neither side has the bishop pair advantage at this point. And uh, it's close to an even position here, really. Maybe still a slight edge for white. Anyway, he, he developed his other knight, knight f6. That's not bad. And uh, I decided to keep my bishop on with bishop b3. He castles. I get my bishop out with bishop g5. I'm starting to worry about the pressure that's building up on the e pawn now that he's castled. It's something I have to be worried about. I don't have those tricks anymore defending it. Um, let's see, he continued with knight e to d7, or knight d2. He brought his knight out to c5. So now he's got three pieces attacking this pawn, <laughs> but I could have simply defended it. Once again, I just kind of uh, missed this move. Um, well, there was one thing I was worried about. I was worried about d5. But in this case, I have a good answer to d5 in uh, e5. And it looks like I might be winning that pin knight. But remember, the weakness of my position is that my queen is undefended. So, so my pawn is pinned. But I get to keep the e-pawn. And he has to uh, unpin his knight here to get out of trouble. And this is still an advantage to white here. So when I play bishop takes f6 here, I'm giving up the, the bishop pair, although I'm holding on to my uh, strong pawn in the center, keeping it at a, on a square where it restricts the motion of his pieces. Um, so it's still good for white a, a little bit, I think. I go rook to e1 here. Maybe once again, I should have retreated the bishop and kept it. Um, but I thought this wouldn't be too bad. He goes ahead and takes, and I take back with the pawn. I, I did look at this with the chess engine because I was wondering whether to take with the knight or the pawn. And the chess engine, you know, first it prefers one move and then it prefers the other. I think it eventually settled on pawn takes. I do have some long-term pressure here. Although he could, he could fix that at any time by playing a7. But at the moment, it does keep his rook tied down, and it gives me a file to operate on with that rook. Um, although, it's uh, although you have an open file there, it's not often that you get that that much of that big a chance to uh, take advantage of it. Anyway, he goes rook f e one here. I go queen to c four. He goes bishop to g five, and move my knight to f three. I really want to keep uh, the imbalance of knight versus bishop here because that will. Uh, well, give me some more chances in the game. If you go into a completely symmetric position, it might get a bit drawish, but I think this game is still pretty lively. He dropped his bishop back to h6, and I pushed on with e5. This is one of the ideas I've been working towards. Um, the knight defending the rook here, so he can't... Um... Oh, well, that, was, that would have been in a different line. I think it is important that the knight defends the rook and also is... Uh, looking at that square. So when he takes, I can take back. Um, the chess engine wouldn't take, by the way. It would just play bishop to g7 and let me take. Uh, let's see, he could, I take, he takes, and maybe even trade rooks. So um, this is still an okay position for uh, for black. But after pawn takes, now, um, now maybe I'm starting to get a winning edge again. Um, the chess engine would like to black to play queen d7. Instead he went queen d6 and there's actually a tactic in this position. So uh, see if you can figure it out. It's white to move. What's the, what's the, what's some tactic that I can play in this position? Okay, I'm going to give the answer away now. Pause the video if you want time to think about it. There's the very cool move, rook takes a7. So this is a case where you've got a dual opposing rooks. <laughs> There's not a simple acronym for this, but uh, but uh, it's an interesting tactic. I've seen it several times. I, I should, uh, if someone thinks of a clever name for it, let me know. <laughs> but uh, the dual opposing rooks, uh, the problem is that uh, if he takes one rook, I take the other. So basically I've just got a, got a free pawn. If, I, if he takes this rook, I take that rook. And his rooks are going with check. 
So um, again, a tempo. So I've just basically won a free pawn and and that tempo. So I have time to, uh, you know, prepare uh, if there's any counterattack from his rook coming down here. I have time to deal with it. Actually, I have this square under control for my knight, so it's not even a problem. Anyway, this this will tell you why uh, queen d7 was a better move than queen d6. Uh, because it holds on to the rook over here, and, and then I wouldn't have that tactic. And after queen d6, I do. Um, but, uh, well, I didn't say that was the best move in this position. In fact, uh, the move I played, rook d5, was equally as good as that uh, tactical move, at least uh, in the chess engine's estimation. So still doing good here. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm keeping a winning advantage, I think. Well, I have one for, for now. Uh, no, I, I take it back. It's it's a it's a one point advantage, not a winning advantage necessarily. So uh, anyway, he moved his queen to the side. I pushed my pawn forward with b4. He was not threatening to take it, but maybe he would take it if my queen disappeared. Um, and then I he played c6. So c6 is really the losing move. This is where I suddenly get a winning advantage. So I had an advantage up to this point, but this is the winning advantage. And um, oh, the reason why. Um, Let's see here, after queen b6, the reason why this uh, b4 move was a little bit suspicious instead of, uh, in, in addition to the fact that it, it's not really needed because it's defended at the moment, I also had this move uh, rook, to, uh, rook to d7 right here, and, uh, and that would have been very strong. But uh, anyway, I played b4, he went c6, and then I saw rook d7. I actually saw it before he played c6 and already started thinking about that. Um, so this is just a move he can't really uh, find any good way to meet. He played rook f8, which is the best of uh, all the bad choices. And I play the natural follow-up, knight e5, which is also the best move here. So I've played a couple of best moves in a row, and uh, and he's in big trouble. Uh, and then bishop e3, a nice you know attempt to get some counterplay. Uh, doesn't work because I can just ignore it. What he really has to play here is uh, queen to b5. Yeah, I was a little worried about this trade of queens, but the chess engine points out that I can just take and then grab this pawn. So I'm going to be up material no matter what. And uh, although this is a pawn, uh, just, although this is just one pawn advantage for me, I also have a pretty, pretty good position in terms of the activity of my pieces. So, so overall, that should be a winning advantage for, uh, for white still. But after bishop e3, uh, well, let's show his idea. If I take, then he takes here with check. I move the king and he takes the knight. And, uh, you know, I'm still better here. He's given up. Uh... Yeah, he's actually won a pawn in this line, hasn't he? But I still have my active pieces and the chess engine still likes white in this position. But of course, um, not by much, just a slight edge to white there. But uh, of course, I don't have to take the bishop. I just uh, take the pawn instead. I could have taken with either the rook or the knight. The important thing is to uh, keep this uh, discovered attack threat on his king. He went ahead and played bishop takes f2 check. I step my king to the side, and then he starts to wiggle out of trouble with king g7. So I played knight g5 check, and actually after this there's a forced mate. I didn't see that all the way through, but I did see that certainly this would be very good for me because I noticed um, that, well, not here. He played, uh, after this, he played king h6. I found the move h4. This is when I noticed that, that I had uh, a winning line. I wasn't, uh, I was feeling pretty confident about the position until this point, but this is a point where I actually calculated a, a, an actual win of material. I was just kind of assuming I, that would be good for me up to this point. Um, and I had to find this move h4. I think that's, uh, was another one of the engine recommendations at this point. Just um, defend the uh, knight at that square and, and set up some additional threats, namely the threat of uh, rick takes pawn mate, which uh, ended the game. The funny thing is, at first I was going to play queen here, which would be checkmate because the queen defends the pawn, except that he could play bishop takes queen. That would have brought the game to a sudden end, a sudden and unfortunate end. So after h4, if he plays bishop takes h4 now, queen takes bishop is mate. So uh, he has to do something else. He tried queen e3 here. Um, 
but of course I can just checkmate him after that. So what he needed to do, forced response here was rook to h8. And then I saw that I had the follow-up knight f7 check. That's when I decided to go with this line. And I'm at least winning the exchange. But it turns out this is a forced mate. It's actually been a forced mate ever since I played knight g5 check. Um, so there's a couple different lines here. For example, if the king goes back to g7, then I have knight h6 check. This is kind of nice. If the king takes the uh, knight and the queen comes in here with a check, he can't run back because of the rook. And so he goes this way and the queen will mate. Um, going back, there's another line here. If he, uh, after, um, yeah, after knight f7 check, if the king goes forward to h5, then I can check this way. Queen e2 check. He can't go back to these squares because the knight's got them covered. He has to come forward. Then I have this check here. And uh, wherever he goes, he's got a whole bunch of moves, but wherever he goes, queen to g5 is checkmate. So uh, there are some other lines there too. It's kind of a, a nice situation. It just shows the power of the queen and the knight against the king, especially when I am backed up <laughs> by a, a rook here, which is cutting off uh, this file if the king goes forward or that row. Anyway, let's go back to the game. After, uh, yeah, after I played h4, I played h4, he played his queen into e3, and then I just uh, took here. That was a, a simple mate. And uh, so anyway, it was a fun game. Hope you guys enjoyed this, and I will see you next time. Bye.